Okay, uh, greetings. Uh, so, welcome to this lecture. So, a quick recap of where we stopped previously. Uh, so, yesterday we are looking at the drum brake, right. So, we looked at uh, the typical operation of a drum brake and uh, we just did a very simple analysis. We saw what was the uh, concept of self energization in drum brake. So, wherein the torque due to the friction force essentially adds on to the torque due to the actuation force, right. So, that is self energization. So, the consequence of that is that like the output from the drum brake uh, particularly what is called as a leading shoe of the drum brake uh, would be a more for a uh, given actuation force, right. So, that is something which we saw and that was quantified by means of what is called as a brake factor. And we did a similar analysis for the trailing shoe and then we saw that uh, uh, this uh, so called self energization is absent in the trailing shoe and uh, so consequently the brake factor is comparatively uh, lower. Right. Uh, so, then we looked at what is called as a two leading shoe brake and the duo servo brake. So, that is where we stopped uh, yesterday. So, today let us start by looking at the uh, disc brake. So, and then like we will do a comparison of both drums and disc you know to gain some understanding. So, in a, a, a typical drum brake is an internal expanding brake right and in a disc brake what happens is that like uh, a rotor connected to the wheel assembly is clasped on either sides by brake pads. So, the brake pads essentially go and touch against the rotor and then like generate friction. So, the displacement of the braking element in a disc brake is along the axis of rotation of the rotor right. So, we have this rotor and we have what is called as a caliper assembly. So, the brake pads are inside okay. So, when the brake is applied, uh, so the brake pads are essentially pressed against the rotor okay. So, that is how the uh, disc brake works. So, a simple schematic is this. So, we can see that the, this is the rotor and uh, what happens is that like uh, uh, this housing is what is called as a caliper housing. We will shortly come to what is called as a floating caliper housing right. We will see what it means. So, when the driver presses the brake pedal, let us say we consider a hydraulic brake system used in passenger cars. So, the brake fluid enters and then like what is going to happen is that like it is going to act on the piston and it will press the this brake pad against this rotor. So, the pressurized fluid will also act on this phase and then move this floater uh, sorry move this so called floating caliper okay towards the right. So, that this brake pad is also pressed against the rotor okay. So, that is the reason why it is called as a floating caliper okay. So, the term floating caliper is because the caliper has some freedom to move along the axis of the rotor right. So, to enable this uh, braking action right. So, uh, we can immediately see that you know this is simpler than what is called as a fixed caliper design. So, wherein in a fixed caliper disc brake, by the way this is a floating caliper disc brake. The schematic that has been drawn corresponds to a floating caliper disc brake. So, in a fixed caliper uh, disc brake uh, you know as we can understand we are going to have the same assembly uh, or set of components that we see on this side on the other side also. So, the caliper will be fixed, but the brake fluid will also enter from the other side and then like press the corresponding brake pad against the rotor. So, obviously, uh, the number of components will increase and we also need to provide brake fluid to both sides right. So, because now we will need a brake fluid and corresponding uh, components like hoses and other elements on this side also right. We will have a similar assembly on the other side right. So, what will happen is that not only the number of components and complexity increase, but in a disc brake you know like its package in the wheel hub. So, there is a space constraint also right. So, we are also constrained by the space that is available for packaging the 
brake in the wheel hub, right? So, uh, in that way, you know, the floating caliper is a uh, better choice, okay? So, uh, that's that's the difference between a floating caliper versus a, a fixed caliper disc brake. Today, we are using floating caliper uh, disc brakes, you know, like. Uh, now, uh, what about is, is analysis that is similar to what we uh, did yesterday, all right? So, let us look at a very simple first cut analysis of uh, the disc brake. So, if we uh, if you are looking from this side, right? So, let us say this is my rotor, correct? And let us say without loss of generality, the rotor is rotating in the counterclockwise direction. Now, what will happen is then we will have the brake pad, let us say, you know, like I am just drawing a rough diagram on one side. So, that is going to be pushed what to say, against the rotor. So, let us say in this schematic the brake pad is moving into the plane, right? So, let us say the brake pad is pushed with an actuation force, let us say lumped actuation force F A. At steady state, what would be the normal reaction? The normal reaction on the brake pad will be equal to F A, right? So, because we are pushing with F A, that is going to be a force that is going to come back. We are once again neglecting inertia and other effects because we are only looking at what happens once the brake has been sufficiently pushed against the rotor, right? Now, uh, if this is rotating counterclockwise, you know, like if I draw the free body diagram of the brake pad, we can immediately see that the uh, friction force on the ro brake pad will be acting in this direction because the friction force on the rotor will be acting towards the other side so that to generate a clockwise brake torque on the pad it is going to act in this way. So, consequently the friction force from the brake pad once again these are this is a very simple lumped analysis just to uh, understand the concept, right? So, from the brake pad is going to be equal to mu times n which is going to be equal to mu times F a. So, we can immediately see that the brake factor of one brake pad in the uh, disc brake, okay? So, there is one side, right? So, we can see that there are in general two uh, what to say the rotor is classed from both ends right from one side right is going to be equal to mu times n that is the output divided by the input is f a right this is the definition of brake factor the friction force output to the actuation force input right. So, once we have this what will we get this is going to be approximately equal to mu. So, we can immediately observe that the brake factor of the disc brake we can essentially say that that is going to be almost equal to 2 mu, okay? because the reason I am putting almost is because this is a simplified first cut analysis, right? So, the main thing is that like, but the main point uh, to observe is that like the brake factor of the disc brake depends on the, what is mu by the way? Uh, it is the brake friction lining coefficient, right? So, we can see that it is almost directly proportional to mu. However, the brake factor of the drum brake was a non-linear function of mu. Please remember this, right? So, the brake factor of the disc brake is going to be almost like 2 mu based on a simple first cut analysis. So, typically, you know, like if you look at a typical disc and drum brakes, right, uh, given the same uh, lining right brake lining you will see that the brake factor of the drum brake would be more than that of the disc brake for typical designs. So, that means that drum brakes are better right is not it because for the same actuation force we are going to get more braking force from the drum brake. Conversely for the same braking force output we need to provide a lesser actuation force. Lesser actuation force means we can go for smaller actuators given given the same brake pressure. We are going to discuss that later on. 
So essentially the brake becomes uh, more uh, much smaller in size the actuator sizes right. So it, it is becomes more compact cost is lower and so on right. So then from all those perspectives you know like drum brakes seem to be better right is not it. So we can observe that by and large the brake factor of the drum is going to be greater than the brake factor of the uh, disc for the same value of mu right so typically okay so so this implies that more uh, brake force output from the drum brake for the same actuation force conversely for this for obtaining the same brake force a smaller actuation force is sufficient is required in a drum brake ok. So, it appears as if like the drum brake is much more advantageous of course it is advantageous from this perspective right because we have the so called self energization which pushes up the uh, brake factor. But of course also kindly recall that yesterday as we discussed the uh, brake factor of the duo servo brake is going to be in between the brake factor of the uh, two leading shoe configuration and the brake factor of the uh, leading uh, trailing configuration right. So, the arrangement of the brake factor will be leading trailing shoe followed by duo servo followed by two leading shoe right. So, that is the uh, uh, what to say sequence of increasing brake factors for drum brake right. However, you know like the irrespective of the configuration for a typical drum brake and disc brake the brake factor of the drum is going to be greater than this. So, the we have these advantages, but then we see that today <coughs> there is an increasing shift towards disc brakes right. So, if you uh, look at an entry level uh, compact passenger car where economy is important people use drum brakes because disc brakes are a bit expensive than drum right. However, if we want performance and we are looking at uh, you know like uh, high end vehicles right you will see that all four brakes would be disc brakes and in the middle segment you will see that there is a trade off right we have disc in the front and drum in the rear. So, we are going to answer at least we are going to discuss right we are going to figure out at least why this is the case from this analysis ok. So, to do that let me once again uh, do a qualitative plot of the brake factor of both brakes versus the uh, brake friction lining coefficient ok. So, this is a this is a qualitative plot of the two. So, let us say the drum brake which is non-linear let us say the brake factor goes something like this right and let us say the disc brake which is linear the brake factor goes something like this ok. So, let us say you know like uh, we start with some initial uh, value of mu let us say we put in the same uh, what to say friction lining in uh, both the brakes. So, mu i being the initial uh, friction lining coefficient. Now, if we go up we can immediately observe once again this is a qualitative diagram please take it in that spirit right. So, we can immediately see that the uh, brake factor of the disc brake is somewhere here and the uh, brake factor of the drum brake somewhere here. 
So, obviously <coughs> till now it appears that the drum is uh, better right oh, ok sorry oh, this should have been I should have labeled the blue curve as drum uh, the green one as disc yeah sorry about that right ok. So, now uh, as we have already seen you know like uh, already discussed right. So, the value of mu keeps on decreasing with usage right. So, essentially you put a fresh lining it will have the best value of mu, but with use what is going to happen due to heat uh, the uh, friction lining coefficient is going to drop right that is what we discussed as brake fade right. So, if you recall the term brake fade, so it is the reduction in mu with uh, increase in temperature. So, the essentially broadly it means that it is the uh, phenomena associated with reduction in the friction characteristics of the lining with increase in temperature right. So, with increase in temperature further there is going to be wear and tear of the brake. So, consequently the uh, value of mu may further reduce right. So, if this happens and let us say for the sake of argument you know in both the uh, disc brake and the drum brake I am exaggerating this just to convey the concept let us say we have the same delta mu right after some time. Now, let us see what happens right. So, I project it once again to get the brake factors once again these are all qualitative curves. So, please take it in that spirit right and now let us look at the new brake factors. So, what is it that we can observe we can immediately observe that the change in the brake factor let us say we call it as delta B of disc is much lower than the change in the brake factor for the drum brake right as we can observe right ok and is this a big advantage of disc brakes yes it is. Why? Because with usage what does it mean? What does change in brake factor mean? You pr keep on pressing the brake pedal in the same way in a car that means we are giving the same actuation force. The change in the brake force output is smaller in disc brake when compared with drum brakes. So, that is an advantage right is not it? Because let us say we take two vehicles you know like one complete vehicle one has all drum brakes and vehicle two has all disc brakes ok for just for the sake of comparison. And let us say we want 100 Newtons of brake force for from either brakes. So, the brakes have been designed for that specification I am just taking the uh, number of 100 Newtons as a round number ok just as an argument. Now, let us say the brakes characteristics friction characteristics keep on changing due to this let us say the disc brake brake factor drops by let us say 5 percent. So, 100 Newtons would have become 95 Newtons when the driver presses the brake pedal completely is not it. So, when the driver presses the brake pedal completely he or she is expecting 100 Newtons that is our expectation right. But with change in this mu 100 would have decreased to 95 and ok I think that may be acceptable to us. On the other hand in a drum brake that 100 Newtons may decrease to 80 Newtons right because of a larger decrease in the brake factor with mu and that may create problems right as time progresses ok. So, that is where that is one of the biggest advantages of disc brakes. So, this is what is called as this is a term used by a few is what is called as mu sensitivity. So, what is mu sensitivity you know like uh, is it, it is indicative of the change in the uh, brakes performance with change in in mu with the change in mu right. So, that is what is called as mu sensitivity. So, we can immediately see that disc brakes 
have a lower mu sensitivity than drum brakes. So, essentially what it means is that with use we get more reliable brake force output from a disc brake right. So, essentially <coughs> this implies more reliable brake force output which matches the design expectations or design specifications as we keep on operating the brake right in the vehicle. Of course, disc brakes are also going to deteriorate okay at some point of time we may need to re replace the brake pads no question about it, but it is just a question of comparison you know which is more uh, sensitive and which is less sensitive to changes in view. So, that is a big advantage of disc brakes point number 1. In this discussion we assume the same delta mu, but the question is if I have the same usage pattern say let us say I have once again vehicle 1 with all drum brakes and vehicle 2 with all disc brakes and let us say I am coming downhill from a hill station and I keep on using the brakes repeatedly. So, what is going to happen the brakes are going to get hot right would they not. The question is would the value of mu decrease by the same amount in both drum and disc certainly not why that is where the better heat dissipation characteristics of a disc brake come into play. So, you can see that in a drum brake if we go on what happens is that there is a drum which is enclosing this entire contraption right. So, when the brake shoe contacts the drum the heat energy has to be dissipated first by conduction through the drum then the drum gets hot and then like the it is transferred to the air which is flowing over the drum okay. So, the drum brake is also a very compact unit okay if you look at one in practice right. So, the air circulation in the drum brake and the mechanism of heat dissipation uh, essentially results in the fact that you know the the heat dissipation characteristics of a drum brake are relatively uh, what to say uh, I would say I would not say poor, but relatively you know like uh, less desirable than in a disc brake. On the other hand in a disc brake the way it is built you can see that the rotor uh, only a part of the rotor is engaged the brake pad the other parts are all open to the atmosphere and you can also see that the rotor has is a has a hollow cavity. So, there are parts which are essentially uh, built into this cavity through which air can flow and that is going to enable better heat dissipation. So, by the design itself the disc brake rotor is exposed to you know better air flow and air flow is also enhanced by these parts for or channels uh, within the rotor. So, those are all like uh, pretty uh, uh, positive aspects of disc brakes okay. So, second point is disc brakes also have better heat dissipation characteristics <laughs> so we can immediately see that disc brakes are less sensitive you know like to essentially uh, potential increases in temperature because not only due to lower mu sensitivity, but also they can uh, dissipate the heat better. So, consequently if we are going to use the uh, drum brake and the disc brake in the same braking maneuver right. So, we pr subjected to the same braking cycle right the temperature increase in the disc brake would be lower right because of better heat dissipation right everything keep being the same 
that is an advantage. So, even brake fade would be lower in magnitude right. So, in a disc brake that is a positive advantage. So, the effective reduction in brake factor also will be lower right when subject to the same brake cycle. So, this essentially ensures that you know like the uh, disc brakes can also be used at higher temperatures. So, the, just the uh, what to say another perspective of this thing is that since they have lower mu sensitivity you can use disc brakes in braking maneuvers and braking cycles where the heat energy which is dissipated is also higher. So, that would result in a higher delta T or a temperature change right because we can still expect some reasonable performance right under a more uh, uh, what to say uh, demanding brake cycle. So, to summarize you know like disc brakes are popular due primarily due to these reasons right one is uh, uh, lower mu sensitivity. So, lower reduction in the brake force output which changes in the value of the friction lining coefficient that is point number one. Second point is better heat dissipation characteristics. So, uh, lower brake fade when subjected to the same brake cycle right uh, when compared to a drum brake. 